Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And welcome to the Native Pollinator Protection installment of the uh, North Fulton Master Gardener Spring Gardening Series. So just a couple of housekeeping tips. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A. This is a Zoom webinar, so the chat is not available. If you have questions, we will look over the Q&A at the end because there's a good chance that if you do have a question, I might answer it during the talk. So with that, let's go ahead and move on. Let me see if I can get the next slide going. It worked before. <laughs> there we go. Uh, my name is Melissa Mateen Murphy. I am the Fulton County Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent. So um, I it, work very closely with all of the master gardeners who have put on these wonderful, wonderful talks for you uh, over the past couple of weeks and will do it again in the fall. So very happy that they invited me to speak on pollinators for them and happy to see you all. Um, another little housekeeping thing. I know we have folks from all over the country and all over the world tuning in. Um, so just a, an apology if you see power flickers or thunder <laughs> or hear thunder, we do have a massive storm rolling through. Um, so just be aware of that. This webinar is also being recorded and um, will be available through Facebook and on the North Fulton Master Gardener YouTube channel. Um, and all attendees will also get a follow-up email in the next few days. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So just remember, uh, please put questions in the Q&A section. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk mainly about protecting Georgia's pollinators. And we're gonna focus mainly on native pollinators. Um, so that's a very important distinction that we'll talk about in a bit. And this is this presentation and the materials and the activities that we're talking about later tonight uh, were developed by specialists and agents across the state as an initiative in partnership with the EPA to promote pollinator protection. So this was our pollinator protection plan for the next five years. Um, so of course, a major part of that is going to be educating the public. I'm sorry, there is somewhat of a delay. There we go. Um, so to understand why pollinators are important, we have to understand what pollination is. Quite simply, it is the transfer of pollen from the male parts of a flower to the female parts of either the same or a different flower. So some plants are self-fertilizing, some plants need multiple plants to be fertilized and produce fruit. So this is incredibly necessary for the production of most of the food and other seed crops that we get across the world. So the annual value of pollination in Georgia alone is well over 360 million. And this num $360 million, this number is even a little bit old. So that's from 2019. So one thing I want y'all to take home from this uh, webinar is that all pollinators, no matter how cute and charismatic are important. So even though we all love the honeybees and the native bees and the butterflies, the wasps and the beetles and other creepy crawlies, even ants are important. Now bees typically outperform other pollinators because they have co-evolved with flowers to have a dietary need for pollen and nectar. So they continuously interact with flowers, be they native flowers or whatever, um, they have available to them. They're also covered in hairs that transfer these pollen grains really easily. Mostly that's so they can take it back to their nest, but it, again, it's also an advantage for the flowers because their pollen gets transferred very easily. Um, so that little note at the end, like I mentioned before, the EPA asks each state to produce a customized plan. So some of you may have seen these brochures on the right. Uh, they were handed out I believe as early as 2016, um, they've been around a long time, but we have made major strides with our pollination, uh, pollinator protection plan, um, and hoping you will participate in some of the fun little activities I talk about later. 
So when we talk about how we can be good stewards of pollinators, uh, we're centering on a couple main concepts and that's gonna be maintaining healthy managed bee colonies, minimizing your pesticide exposure and conserving and supplementing pollinator habitat. This is so important because honeybees and native bees are both incredibly important to us, just in different ways. Honeybees are an economic necessity. We need them for agriculture and they have become naturalized in the United States, even though they're from Europe. However, native bees are an ecological necessity. We need to maintain the biodiversity and the native species of our habitats to maintain that equilibrium in our ecosystem. So by managing bee colonies, uh, in a, in a responsible way, you know, realizing that they are in fact livestock, they do need to be cared for. And by conserving the pollinator habitat to make sure that everybody has enough resources, um, help both your, na your native bees and your honeybees, while at the same time minimizing pesticide exposure is great for all bees. And we all have a role to play in this pollinator stewardship. But You've got to learn to identify your native bees before you can really help them. So here's our, here are some of the most common ones or the most famous ones. So on the left, we do have carpenter bees. So a lot of people roll their eyes when I do mention carpenter bees. They are native and they are important pollinators, even though they do uh, bore into wood and are considered a bit of a pest. Um, we do have bumblebees. So a you know, this is, of course, the rusty patched bumblebee, which is experiencing some stress right now and is um, very, very threatened. We have sweat bees, cuckoo bees, leaf miner bees, um, and mason bees. So all, or leaf cutter bees, all sorts of native bees that carry pollen all sorts of ways um, and pollinate from flower to flower. So first are carpenter bees. Like I mentioned before, they do bore into wood. They have a black bar body um, with a golden fuzzy thorax. They have very, very dense hair on their head and in their thorax, but no hair on the abdomen. That's really important because a lot of times these, even though these guys are really, really big, they're gonna be the same size as some of the bumblebees you see. But that's gonna be the difference is a, we call it a shiny hiney. Um, so they are gonna have the nice shiny abdomens there because they don't have any hair on them. Their head is very broad, their body is very thick and the males are going to have a white coloring on their face. Sometimes it's a little bit more yellowish as in this picture, but a lot of times it'll appear white. Um, so that's how you can tell, you can actually pick these guys up and play with them because male wasps do not sting. The stinger is a modified ovipositor, which if you take the word apart, ovipositor, egg place. Um, so that means it actually is a, uh, an altered organ that only is found in female insects that is typically used to lay eggs. So um, just a fun fact there, if you get stung by a wasp, it is 100% female. However, the females are all black on the face and they are typically um, the ones making the holes and making the nests and caring for the young. Bumblebees, on the other hand, um, can also be rather large, but they have a lot of different patterns. So you can see the one in the lower left is actually all black on the abdomen, but um, they, it's kind of fuzzy, right? So it's not as shiny as the carpenter bee. And sometimes you will also have, um, you know, yellow and black stripes, almost like a little cartoon. Sometimes you will have different colored um, patches like the rusty patch bumblebee. And a lot of times these will be in nests just like honeybees are. They do not have the same eusocial organization um, in that, um, you know, they, they don't operate as a large super organism like honeybees do, but they do live in colonies, as you can see in the lower right. Some people may even think that their colonies look like uh, a type of fungus because of how they build up the wax. 
Um, they look like these little cups all around the bases of trees or under porches, um, things like that. And yeah, so that's our bumblebees, our nice fuzzy little bumblebees. And here's an example. Um, so you can see kind of a size difference from one of our native bumblebees, but you can also see how much fuzzier and the different proportions of the head. So see that carpenter bee in the upper left, the thorax and the head are about the same width, whereas the bumblebee in the lower right has much broader shoulders. The thorax is a lot thicker compared to the head. Um, so again, just kind of using that um, as a guide. And then this is another one, another example of a, a bumblebee and a honeybee. Even though it looks very similar to a carpenter bee, um, it is actually a type of bumblebee. And so there's that size difference there. Um, and so honeybees are going to be a little bit more golden colored. They always have a striped abdomen. They're pretty uh, pretty charismatic um, and easy to tell apart from other bees. They have a very distinctive appearance. Now, sweat bees are another very important native bee. Uh, they are a type of digger bee. So they dig into the soil or they, the sand. They love sandy soil. So a lot of times you'll see them near riverbeds or river, uh, river banks. Um, and they'll make all of these little holes and they'll nest around in groups, but they do not form colonies. They are gregarious, not social. They like to be near each other, but they like to have their own apartments. They are attracted to human sweat because of the minerals it contains. So they don't only need nectar, they also need electrolytes and minerals that humans and other animals shed in tears and in sweat. So this is why we call them sweat bees. They're pretty active until October or November. Um, you might be seeing some out now, depending on which zone you're in. If you're south of Macon, you might see these a little sooner rather than later. So they can be brightly colored like this guy. They can be an iridescent greenish yellow, or they can also be black and yellow, um, or they can be a little hybrid of the two. So the front half can be iridescent green and the back half can be striped uh, black and yellow, or maybe even appear black and white. These guys do prefer smaller flowers because they are very, very small compared to even honeybees. Um, they are maybe the length of your finger, your pinky fingernail, if that. They are very, very, very small, um, slightly larger than ants. Mason bees are another very important native pollinator. So they're called mason bees because they line their nests with mud. So they will take soil into their mouth and make a bit of a paste. And they will make cells where they will pack pollen and then lay their egg, seal the cell, pack more pollen, lay another egg, seal that cell off, and continue on down the nest. Now, they do not make the holes in their nests. Uh, they are not like carpenter bees. They prefer, prefer pre-existing holes. So you can do that. Uh, you can provide nests for them by having empty bamboo reeds, making rolls out of cardboard or uh, thick construction paper. Also, uh, some of these species prefer the stems of plants like echinacea or black-eyed Susan or lobelia really pithy plants that once you deadhead them, the stem becomes hollow. So this is why we leave a little bit of length on our stems over the winter uh, because, and you just kind of deadhead some of the stems over the summer too, because that way they can actually lay their eggs in there and then they will hatch and emerge the next season or the next year rather in spring. And also another note about both mason bees and leafcutter bees that we're gonna talk about now. Um, your native bees typically carry pollen on the undersides of their abdomen. So their, their corbicula or pollen basket is located on the undersides of their abdomen or their tummy, the ventral side. So they are very similar in size and habit to mason bees. It's almost impossible to tell them apart unless you very, very regularly see the two together. Um, they use leaves to cap their nests off instead of uh, mud. So you can see that here, they'll actually cut out semicircular portions of leaves. You can see there's a red bud tree in the lower right. They typically like um, 
smoother, thinner leaves to pack their nests. So if you see this type of damage on your plant, don't panic. It's actually very good. They do not hurt the plant. The damage is totally taken care of by the plant. So it won't regrow that tissue, but it does not stress the plant at all or the tree, whatever they get it from. They are very, very fast flyers. They are all yellow and black. Sometimes it might look like they're a little bit more white and black, but again, very similar um, to mason bees. Main difference there is species and the material that they use to form their nests. Wasps are also very, very important pollinators. Here we see a couple different types, and I have done a lot of wasp education over the past couple of years with the introduction of the Asian giant hornet in Washington. Um, however, they have not been found on the East Coast and they have certainly not been found in Georgia. So that is good news for us, though of course we must remain vigilant. There is no need to panic. Um, and I have not seen one identified correctly as an Asian giant hornet at all. So no need to worry. We have a lot of different wasps that are pollinators. Primarily they are potter wasps and paper wasps. Sometimes people call these mud daubers because of how they make their nests. So the potter wasps are going to very similar to the mason bees, take up soil in their mouth or clay and make long cylindrical cells to lay their eggs. Um, a lot of times you'll see these, uh, if you have like a deck, they'll um, make their nest on the undersides of the um, two by fours of your deck. They really, really like to do that. Um, or your roof or things like that. Again, not super aggressive because these are just wasps. Um, and then there's also paper wasps that will make an umbrella shaped nest. And some other wasps will make a big, um, almost cylindrical or spherical kind of globular nest as well, attached by a single thin point called a pedicel. So these are generally gonna be hairless though they do have some hair. And most of the pollinators are gonna have very, very, very narrow waists uh, where the abdomen and the thorax connect. And do note that yellow jackets are not going to be seen at flowers very often. Um, they typically get their nutrition from other sources. Um, they are not significant pollinators at all. They are more scavengers than predators. Flies are also really important pollinators, even though you wouldn't necessarily think it, but there are a lot of flowers that have very spicy, pungent odors specifically to attract flies. Um, but it can be kind of hard to tell the difference between both bees and flies because a lot of flies are actually bee mimics because animals know that bees can sting and so they don't wanna eat bees very often. So flies capitalize on that by looking like bees. So the difference is bees have four wings. So they have two pairs, each different sizes. They have very prominent antenna and two large eyes. And if you look very closely, you'll see three smaller ones between the two large eyes. They almost look like um, pinheads and they're called ocelli. These are the simple eyes. They just notice light differences. So they notice if there's a bird over them or something that can indicate a predator. They carry pollen in pollen baskets or corbicula um, or scopa, which is on the bottom of the abdomen and are generally very, very hairy. Flies on the other hand have only two wings. So they have a single pair of wings. They have smaller antenna. They're very stubby, often brush-like, hard to see, not like bees that are long and slender. They have two prominent eyes, no ocelli or simple eyes. They do not actually carry pollen that well. Um, they're going to do better within flowers that can be self-pollinating. They don't carry flower, um, carry pollen in flight like bees do because they're not generally very hairy. Now you get a flower with like a lily or something like that, very strong uh, scent, and the male parts are very close to the female parts and they're covered in pollen, flies are great for that. 
Um, but other things that require the pollen to move from flower to flower, not so much, but they are very important. Now, things like surfid flies are gonna be some of the most common bee mimics that you see. Um, so notice the very, very small antenna right at the front, very large eyes and no simple eyes between the two large eyes. Um, also, it's kind of hard to tell, but if you look closely, it only has two wings. If it were a bee, you would see another smaller set of wings under each of those large wings. Um, and they're usually a little bit darker. They're not always clear like that. So surfeit flies also have a very distinctive flight pattern. I call them like little UFOs. Instead of fighter jets zipping around everywhere um, and making loop-de-loops, these guys zip from one spot to another and they just sit there and they stare at you, which leads them to their other common name, the hoverflies, because that's what they do. They sit there and they hover perfectly still in space. Um, so their habits are a little bit different as well. So now that I've told you some common players as far as um, important pollinators that we need to keep an eye out for, what is your role, right? As a homeowner, as a landowner, also as a renter, as a renter, you know, if you don't have a lot of space, what can you do? Okay. Sorry, sometimes it freezes a bit. Also, I've gotten other things. There we go. All right. Um, so what can you do to actually help protect your pollinators and really advocate for them? First things first, know the beekeepers in your neighborhood. The bees provide free pollination for you. If you have a garden of any type, you need to be best friends with your beekeeper because you are using his bees. Even if that beekeeper is a mile or two away, odds are his bees are finding your property and using the flowers on your property and pollinating them. Also avoid applications of any systemic insecticides to the soil around the flowers, trees, or shrubs. So a very common one that is used is uh, bare rose and shrub. And um, there, you really have to pay attention to what you're using because you don't want any of the insecticide to get translocated into the nectar. So if you do use one of these products, make sure it's a granular product, not a ready to use product or a liquid product because the granular products do not translocate into the nectar or pollen and they do not affect um, bees in the same way as other types of pesticides can. And two, always have a level of tolerance. You don't necessarily need to spray or apply anything when you see that first insect. If nothing's eating your garden, it's not part of the ecosystem, right? Now, I know a lot of us have lawns. I personally don't. <laughs> well, somewhat. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but if you must apply an insecticide, if you have a horrible Japanese beetle problem or chafers or something, um, some sort of pest in your turf, first mow your grass immediately before applying the insecticide. This is going to get rid of all of the flower heads that the bees could possibly visit. It'll get rid of your henbit, your dead nettle, your speedwell, violets, dandelions, anything like that, that your uh, bees might be looking to as a resource. Also, it's great to leave significant areas of your property permanently undisturbed. We have a lot of bees, including the sweat bees that we talked about, that nest in the soil. We also have a lot of other critters that nest in leaf litter. So it's not necessary to blow all your leaves off all the time. It's okay to leave a nice layer of leaf litter. We have a policy at my house that's a very happy medium. We have spots that we cannot leave knee deep in leaves. So what we do is we move all the leaves over into our ornamental beds and we use it as a natural mulch. That way we uh, can reduce the negative impact on the critters that might be using that as a shelter. But we also keep things looking a little tidier and uh, keep things accessible and maybe reduce the chance of snakes getting in the house or chipmunks or something like that. But also providing nest building materials and things for other critters like 
you know, waxy leaved plants or thin leaved plants, whatever kind of uh, insect you want to attract. Also, if you have um, maybe a right of way near you or you have a pasture near you, leaving those permanently idled um, with just kind of some, a nice mixture of uh, either reseeding annuals or easy to care for perennials are a great option. So if you want a low maintenance option that's gonna be good for the environment, native asters are fantastic. They love those full sun um, open spots. And if you are on a slope, they'll definitely help with erosion as well. Um, and honeybees absolutely love these. They bloom with so many flowers. They're a fantastic resource for honeybees and native bees alike. Now this, we mentioned uh, <laughs> that I don't have a lawn and this is actually what my lawn looks like. So, um, and this is what it looks like right now. Um, February and March are my, it, it's my favorite time of year because my lawn is purple. Um, and that is no exaggeration. So up here we have henbit, we have the little blue flowers, our speedwell, we've got plenty of violets. Um, and then over here to the left, you can tell this was one of the first bees that we saw. Um, and this is a carpenter bee. And can anybody put in the Q&A, do you think it's a male or a female? I'm just wondering if anybody can guess. Did you see its face right there? Is it a male or female? Male, exactly. So you could poke this guy and he would just get really mad. He wouldn't sting you at all. Um, but see all that henbit, these winter weeds that a lot of people try to control in their yard are the first sources of nectar for bees that wake up. So that's why we work really hard to maintain these until it starts looking a little unruly, uh, a little bit more like this. So my rule of thumb, and you can actually see where we mowed around it to make it look purposeful so people didn't think we had abandoned our <laughs> house. Um, but you can see there's still some dandelions popping up. But my rule of thumb is when the vetch pops up. That is when it's time to mow and when there's going to be enough alternate uh, resources for these bees that you can do a good mow on your lawn without reducing um, their nectar supplies. So again, once it gets starting to look like this, I know that's not super attractive, so we keep it a, a little well mowed, um, but there's other things on our property. The azaleas start to bloom. Um, we've got hellebores, we've got daffodils, tulips, all sorts of other things, zinnia, um, nasturtium, they're popping up as well. So not a big deal to mow everything down, keep it nice and tidy from then on. So if you have another idled sunny patch that maybe you don't want native asters or you can't find native asters or you want just something with not as fine and overgrown of a texture, uh, a mixture of annual and perennial flowering plants is great. Um, so we always get the question right here of, well, should I plant native plants or not? And the important thing is to plant pollinator plants. You want your plants to be blooming year round. You want them blooming ideally from now all the way until the first freeze. So that includes everything from rhododendrons, to azaleas, camellias, to things pictured here like zinnia. But of course, not all of those are native, but they're still great for bees. Um, there are very few things that are not invasive here that are, um, well, let me rephrase that. There are very few pollinator plants that are invasive. So <laughs> odds are things like zinnia, which are native to Mexico, not here, um, but they thrive here and bees love them and they very, very healthily supplement their intake of nectar and important resources, they're fine. They're a great pollinator plant to plant. I'm not going to tell someone not to plant them just because they're not native. Um, we really just need to boost our pollinators um, with non-invasive plants. That's going to be the really important way to do that. And just spreading a seed mix is often the cheapest and easiest way to do it. Take a rake, rake a bare spot up, get that soil nice and loose, scatter the seeds, 
water them in, maybe put a little bit of mulch down and then you're good to go. Also consider making an actual dedicated pollinator space. So we've talked a little bit about how you can use spaces that you're not really sure about, but maybe consciously make a pollinator garden as well. So we have a portion of our herb bed in uh, right in front of the house that is specifically parsley and bronze fennel, just like this. Um, we've got uh, bee balm and uh, rosemary, which is also a great pollinator plant. Things that double as culinary herbs, as well as really important native host plants. Um, and this bronze fennel pictured at the bottom, you can actually see swallowtail caterpillars. And I was so excited. We had swallowtails on our bronze fennel um, this year where I, we watched them crawl up, make their, make their chrysalis and uh, emerge all in about a week. So you definitely, if you put it there, they will show up. Another thing you can do is provide puddles, which are basically troughs for bees and butterflies and other pollinators um, to get minerals. So this is a behavior called puddling. I mentioned sweat bees can actually do it on um, humans or animals that sweat or drink tears. Some of you may have seen, um, there's a National Geographic picture of a lot of moths and butterflies drinking crocodiles tears. That's why they do it for the minerals that's in the salt in that fluid. Um, so you can do, you can create little puddles by putting river sand and river stones in a shallow dish and then keeping it nice and moist. Imagine like a puddle in a stream bed. You don't necessarily want standing water because then you'll get mosquitoes, but you do want enough water to keep it damp to loosen up that those minerals for the bees and butterflies and whatever other pollinators might be interested in using it. Um, so I mentioned some activities that we have coming up and one is the uh, citizen science activity known as the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. So that's gonna be on August 19th and 20th of this year. Technically it is only for Georgia residents, but definitely follow up if you're interested and you're outside of Georgia because there are several states that are uh, creating their own pollinator census. So this is a Friday and a Saturday, and uh, we specifically pick these dates because it's when almost every single county in Georgia is in school. So it's a Friday and a Saturday. So if you're a teacher looking for a cool STEM activity to do that's pollinator based, this would be great. Um, or if you're looking for something to do on that weekend, that would also be great. So anybody can participate. You can be an individual, you can be a family, you can be a church group, a scout group, you can have acres of land, you can have a small lot, you can have a balcony with a single flower on it and participate. As long as you have something blooming in August, you can participate in this citizen science project. Um, so how we do this is you will sit at a pollinator plant for about 15 minutes and count the insects that visit it. So they're going to be easily recorded on the project website. Um, and they're going to be the types of insects that we talked about in this PowerPoint. Butterflies, bumblebees, carpenter bees, honeybees, native small bees, and other insects. You don't have to be an entomologist to do this count. If you could tell the difference between all those, then you can participate and your data will be counted. Um, so there's a very easy way to do this. I have the website uh, listed on one of these slides and we can certainly share it with you afterwards. Um, but again, I just wanna stress that you should make sure your pollinator garden includes plants that will be blooming in August. So in Georgia, that means really full sun, heat loving, um, plants that are nice and vibrant and can tolerate the late summer heat and humidity very well. This is an example of what the counting sheet looks like. Again, you can find it on that website. You can see it at the bottom there, ggapc.org. Um, and there is not only the county sh counting sheet and the counting guide, there's also information for teachers if you want to use this as part of your curriculum. 
lots of really great resources there for you if you are interested. Um, so just take note, it is a little easier to print this off in color, but again, as long as you have the concepts down of who's who, you don't even have to tell the difference between mason bees and sweat bees. They're just all listed as small bees um, and wasps, carpenter bees, all sorts of things like that. If there's something you don't know or it's not one of those categories, the very, very bottom, there's also an other insects category. So in 15 minutes at a single plant, you will just count the number of insects and then um, you will record the weather conditions up at the top, what type of plant you are actually observing, the date, the time, and the temperature. This, these are all really important data points for us to have. And uh, we do have an updated counting and identification guide on the website for you there. So feel free to let us know if you have any questions. And we hope to see you in August taking part in this because it's really fun. And then finally, um, one way that I always recommend people um, help out our native bees because so many of them like to live in pre-made holes is provide shelter. This is another fun activity that you can do with kids or just yourself. I love making these, um, is making native bee houses. So you can take them and have pre-made reeds. Um, so you can see on the right where it looks like a little birdhouse. Um, you can put all sorts of different substrates in there. You can drill holes into wood. So that's honestly the easiest way to do it um, and how I personally make my nests. So uh, you can take a four by four with you know, just a typical post made out of cedar or untreated pine. It needs to be untreated for sure. Um, and then drill holes. I use a 16. Um, I believe it's a 16 drill, 16th of an inch drill bit. Um, and just drill little holes and they will love it. They will come immediately to it. You can also put a little roof over it just to shield it from rain and reduce the amount of mold and fungus that lives in there after a season. Um, but if you set these out, they are looking for homes like this right now. So if you put one out, you will start to see these holes sealing up very, very quickly. And then you just leave it there until this time next year, at which time you will see all the holes pop out and you will get new uh, little critters to pollinate your garden. And they will know that you are a friend of pollinators. So definitely something to consider. It's a very easy project. Um, typically we do recommend replacing each of these cells every year uh, because they are not going to reuse them. And that could promote fungus and mold and all all sorts of nasty stuff in the bee house. Um, but just remember, if you build it, they will come. Um, so be a good steward of your pollinators. Give them as many reasons to visit your property as possible, no matter how much or how little space you have. And I'm sure they will appreciate it no matter what. So that's the end of uh, the topics I have. But of course, as usual, we do want to say thank you to all of our promotional partners um, on behalf of North Fulton Master Gardeners. So you'll see UGA Extension Fulton County is there, um, as well as a lot of other really great organizations that have helped us promote um, this series. The, Fulton County Master Burners have done a great job. And also thanks to our different media partners that have interviewed or um, helped to promote as well. And then here you can see the upcoming fall classes. The next one is going to be Sunday, March 13th. That's gonna be all about plant toxins. Um, I believe Ms. Linda is giving that. So that's gonna be a fantastic talk if you can tune in. Uh, please, you know, the Sundays are great for conversations because we typically have less people on there. So you get some one-on-one -on -one time with gardening experts. Um, you can also view past classes on the North Fulton Master Gardeners YouTube channels. And there is that link there, which will also be included in the follow-up email to register for the future classes. So with that, um, I can stop my screen share and we can take any questions.
Thanks so much, Melissa. This is terrific information and uh, the uh, presentations with the screen sharing sure do give a, a really good close up view of some very tiny and important <laughs> animals <laughs> and insects. Anyway, we do have some questions and we may have some more, but let me try to uh, touch as many as I can. Okay. Um, and I'll use first names if that's okay. I, mm -hmm. I apologize if uh, there are more than one Anne and I and don't <laughs> uh, make the difference. But here we go. Uh, Bonnie asked um, why uh, females are called wood munchers. You may have got covered this in the carpenter part of it, and that may be the answer. But she's wondering why are females called wood munchers? We, that's just colloquial. That was just to help y'all remember that females are the ones that make the nests. So they're the ones making the holes in your wood. And a, and a similar question, Bonnie also asked, is there any um, helpful way to, as she put it, I think, dissuade carpenter bees from uh, <laughs> basically taking apart your um, porch post? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so what I always recommend to people first, go around varnish or paint. A lot of people have stained materials that doesn't actually produce a barrier that they'll have to chew through that might not taste so well. So always varnish or paint. If you get to the point where the carpenter bees are challenging the structural integrity of something like a gazebo or a deck, then you do have to consider more lethal options. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate they are native, but they are not threatened in any way, shape or form. And you, the methods that you use to treat for them do not affect any other bees because there are no other bees that are going to be using carpenter bee holes. So if that becomes a problem, I can give a, a customized recommendation, but otherwise try to coexist as much as you can. Great. Uh, Tom and Linda ask about the difference between sweat bee holes and ant holes, which seem to, in some cases at least, appear to be the same. They can be very, very similar. Um, ants are not, or sweat bees are not going to constantly rebuild their holes. And so a lot of times you'll see a mound immediately after the holes are created. Um, but the mound won't necessarily stay there and it won't be as dramatic as ants. So a lot of times, um, you know, it can be really hard to tell because that's pr a pretty arbitrary way um, of telling, but you'll also see trailing around ants um, and ant hills. So you'll see little pads worn in the soil as well. Um, so it's one of those things where you have to be a bug nerd like me and look at all of these different things a lot to really be able to tell the difference. But if you're ever unsure, just let us know. Send us an email or your local extension office and uh, we can help you tell the difference. But if there's holes, odds are you'll see ants around it. If you don't see ants around them, probably be holes. You raise a good point, though, uh, in suggesting that if we have questions, uh, calling the extension service and uh, either talking with the agent or getting in touch with a master gardener can sometimes mm -hmm. uh, help you track down an answer if we don't know it already. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, sorry, go ahead. So oh, that's, and, I was just agreeing. <laughs> <great>. <laughs> of course you would. You're an excellent agent. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Anne had a couple of great questions. Um, mm -hmm. She's wondering about some neighbors who are using insecticides, presumably in a helpful way, um, but she's wondering about how far that kind of spray can go um, as far as her, I, I assume her or others properties. That is a great question and that's going to depend on how responsible your neighbor is. So all pesticides, whether they are insecticides, herbicides, or fungicides have a label and the label is the law, whether they are restricted chemicals or they're just found ready to use at Home Depot. Everyone has to follow those label instructions and those label instructions and the dosing rates and the application instructions are specifically designed to minimize the environmental risk. So there are some herbicides, say, I, I think it's either I think it's dicamba that if you spray 
above 85 degrees, you can cause injury and it can volatilize and drift over onto another property. So that's why you don't apply it above 85 degrees. With insecticides, we don't see that as much um, because a lot of times once they dry onto the plant, they're there. Um, or they can be systemic or they're contact based. They're not necessarily, um, there are very few that can be as dramatic as mosquito fogging that are aerosolized and, and can be drifting over. So it's always good if you have a good relationship with them, have a talk about it and maybe see, and um, you know maybe even plant some non-flowering shrubs as a screen if you're really worried about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne also had a good question about uh, a particular place where you would have a pollinator plant. We often see uh, great pollinator plants in the bright sunshine. And she's asking about what might be a recommendation for a good pollinator plant or two in shade. This is a great plug for my talk tomorrow night at 7 p.m. That is shade gardening for pollinators. So you can register for that on Eventbrite. I will provide the link. Um, to uh, the Master Gardener crew so they can send that out to folks. Or you can also uh, look up Fulton County Cooperative Extension on Eventbrite, Google us, or look, uh, look at us on Facebook and you can see the event there and purchase tickets that way. It is free, but you do need to register to receive the Zoom link. If you can't register and you are attending this session, um, then just shoot me an email directly or get into contact with us. And we will also post the archive of that. But things like hostas, heuchera, uh, coral bells, um, anything that flowers like that are great for your smaller bees. Our carpenter bees still love the hostas, that flower. And then there's also things like trillium that are great for our native pollinators like beetles and flies and things like that. So we'll go over a lot of options tomorrow. Sounds like a great resource for that question. Um, Gay asked about uh, getting a, an, a bamboo bee hotel or house, but it's unused. And she's wondering if there's a reason that you might think of about why it's not being used by the bees. That is a good question. Okay, so it depends on the time of year that was it that it was put out. So if you put it out in January and it hasn't been used, they probably haven't found it yet because we're just now peaking on nesting season. Um, it could also be that it's not in a great spot. Is it southward facing? Is it protected by chilly winds? Um, is it up a little bit? You know, maybe having it at eye level can be helpful. Um, and, you know, making sure it stays warm or at least at a consistent temperature and is protected by drafts. Also, depending on the size of the reeds, um, they might be too big or too small and the local bee population in your area might not actually fit them. But I would say most of the times when people have a nest that is not used, it's placement issues. Good point. Uh, Theresa asked, uh, which bees make their nests in the ground? So those would be the sweat bees and the digger bees. So they burrow into the ground. They are not to be confused with the ground dwelling wasps though. So things like solitary wasps, like cicada killers that will not hurt you at all, or things like yellow jackets that have communal nests in the ground. Um, but typically our sweat bees and our digger bees are gonna be the ones um, that, that make the holes. And right now there's actually, we've seen kind of a, a lecking or congregating habit um, that bees will do and they'll kind of all swarm around um, when they emerge in March. And I, the first time I saw that was in 2020 and it was just the most fascinating thing. Um, I don't know if we have anybody in the Atlanta area um, that goes to the little Riverside parks or anything, um, but that's where we found them in, in all of this underbrush and there were just hundreds of bees um, all waking up and courting and mating and nesting and all sorts of stuff all at once for about three weeks and then they were just gone. Uh, Valerie uh, also asked an interesting question about those pollinator houses. Mm -hmm. uh, she'd like to know how far away from your house or patio they should be. Oh, it doesn't matter. 
um, as long as they're not constantly disturbed. So you can put them on the side of your house um, if there's a good spot for them and if it's protected. Um, I, you know, I typically don't recommend places like patios um, or if, if you do put it on a patio, make sure it's secured and maybe facing outward, not inward of the patio or the deck uh, because you don't want the bees to be spooked away. You don't want anything to knock it over. Um, you don't want too much activity around it or, or any kind of disturbances. Good point. Uh, one person without a name uh, for us uh, asked the question, uh, what do you feel uh, is going on with the mosquito spraying companies that claim to be friendly to pollinators? Uh, is it true? Can that be? It can. It can. So um, I personally um, have found more sustainable ways to do it. Um, but there are going to be some instances like in Atlanta, we have a terrible English ivy problem and mosquitoes love to roost in English ivy. And so what these companies typically do is they only target the non-flowering underbrush where bees are not found. And they will typically do it incredibly early in the morning or later at night after the bees have already gone to sleep. The real problem is when they fog in the middle of the day indiscriminately. Um, so that can definitely be, be a problem. But there's also contact insecticides that can be put on the English ivy when the mosquitoes land to roost, they take up those insecticides and um, the mosquitoes themselves are targeted. Um, again, for mosquito control, honestly, my favorite control method is a box fan because mosquitoes can only fly two miles an hour. And if you have a box fan next to you in the middle of summer, they cannot compete with it. <laughs> Good point. And you stay nice I'll and cool. To, I'll have to remember that one too. Yep. Um, Caroline asked, uh, after the Mason bees have left the bee hotel or the house, or other bees have left that kind of uh, nesting area. Uh, can those be used again or do they have to be cleaned out? Um, if you use just the method I talked about where it's just a block of wood where you put the, where you drill holes, you should completely replace that. Um, you can drill more holes in it um, or you can try to re-drill the holes, but again, that's going to get into those mold and moisture and fungal issues that we talked about. Um, if it was one of those birdhouse style ones, you can replace all of the reeds that have been used with fresh reeds too. Um, so depending on the style, you can get a different number of uses out of it. But do remember, because it's untreated wood, it won't last as long as a lot of other things. So it'll probably last like three to four years tops, but it'll be worth it for the amount of pollinators you promote. Uh, a question occurs to me sort of about the same topic. If you were to use a two by four or some other larger piece of wood that you could drill holes in, I'm assuming that the hole should be drilled slightly upward so rain doesn't get too much in the hole and Maybe you have an idea about how deep the hole should be drilled. We actually have plans on how to make that on the ggapc.org website. It gives you the dimensions and everything, um, but you are correct. It does need to be a certain depth. Usually if I take that drill bit and I, I think it's, I can't remember if it's a number 16 or a 16th inch, but it's like the normal kind of drill bit. <laughs> I, it's one of the most common ones I use around the house. Um, and you can use a couple different sizes too, because different bees will prefer different size holes. Um, but just drill it all the way in until you can't drill anymore, especially if it's a four by four. Um, and that's the perfect depth for them. Um, you know, something like a two by four, you can't just do an inch deep. You've got to do, you know, probably at least, you know, two to three inches deep because they want to put multiple cells. Um, so they can be, they can insulate their young. Makes good sense. And, and you uh, do want them straight. You do actually want them straight. Uh, it's easier for them to, to use that way. Great. Uh, Becky asked, uh, are dragonflies considered pollinators? No, they are considered predators. They might be incidental pollinators. And what we mean by that is they might see 
a moth or a fly at a flower and then eat it and then get pollen on it and then do the same thing to another flower and it rubs a little pollen off, but they are not pollinators in the sense that they have co-evolved with plants to move pollen from one source to another. And uh, Tanya is curious about where, where you might suggest looking for the kinds of uh, materials to create little bee uh, hotels or houses. Um, if you have any suggestions other besides the drilling of holes. <laughs> yeah, you so you mentioned the stems of a fairly mm -hmm. uh, large porous uh, plants that are, have died. But you might have another suggestion about where to find other kinds of tubing or things like that. Honestly, small bamboo reeds are really great ways to go. Any kind of reed that hollows out naturally as it dries. Um, and two, you can also take uh, butcher block paper or any kind of thick paper and roll it up. Um, you can roll it around a large pencil and then tape it and then use those in the birdhouse style um, or a little box or something. Um, and they typically like those as well. Um, the vicinity, you know, it, it, it's good to space them out if you can. So if you are drilling holes, maybe have them like an inch or two apart, because you might notice that, um, out of every, you know, two or three reeds, only one of them is being used because they do like a little bit of space. Um, but as far as other materials, like I mentioned, the drill, um, and the untreated lumber, honestly, we just got ours from Home Depot because they're a partner with us and they, they provide a lot of materials for us. They have the untreated options. You can go to a local lumber store, um, anything like that. Um, uh, but the easiest way for me to find and to do it is just to go to Home Depot. They cut it in tw they can't cut it any smaller than 12 inch because of OSHA regulations, but just cut a 12 inch block of cedar um, and drill a bunch of holes in it and you're good to go. That's all you need. Great, great. Uh, Almas asked uh, an interesting question related to a typical situation in a uh, homeowner uh, subdivision where there may be some kind of homeowner association uh, requirement about the minimum square footage of typical lawns. Um, and of course, you so, showed us some fabulous alternatives. And in mm -hmm. fact, there's going to be another one of these workshops on alternatives to lawns. Uh, but she's wondering about um, if there is any other suggestion you have uh, about dealing with those kinds of covenants in homeowner associations. Yes, that's precisely why I bought where there isn't a homeowners association. <laughs> um, I would yes. say I've had the best success with just education. Um, so a lot of times all they want is just a green lawn, um, which is technically a monoculture. It doesn't serve very much of a purpose, but if you are able to install flowering plants in other places on um, your property, definitely do so. Um, you know, I don't know of a single HOA that won't allow azalea bushes. Um, <laughs> and they're pretty hardy and they love our uh, acidic soil. Um, so you can make up for it in other ways, but also just go to your HOA or reach out. I love speaking to HOAs and telling them, hey, if you allow for this alternative, you get to say that you're sustainable and you're eco-friendly and you're doing this, but it also looks attractive. So there is a happy medium there. So be happy to, um, I don't know if you're in Fulton County or not, but feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to your HOA or provide you with some materials that can um, support your point. Very good point. Uh, Joanna, uh, excuse me, Jean, Gina. Uh, Gina asked uh, how to attract bees to her apple trees. Mm, usually they'll just come because they love apples. <laughs> <laughs> you need apples um, uh, or you need bees for your apple trees to set fruit. Um, if you have just apple trees and you're having trouble getting bees, that may mean that there's a problem with biodiversity in your area. So you might need to do some more heavy lifting as far as installing some more um, floral resources because apple trees don't bloom very long. 
so you will need to install things that will bloom for a more um, consistent length of time to you know, kind of get your property associated as a resource with the local pollinators. Uh, Jennifer asked uh, about uh, having recently gone to a garden center and uh, they had a number of uh, cultivated flowers, cultivars, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they as good pollinator plants as others or should you be careful about getting those? Um, it depends on the variety. So I, the thing that comes to mind is milkweed because you only want native milkweeds. You do not have native milkweeds. It's not great for uh, monarchs because it can potentially vector um, viruses and it's not as nutritious for them and things like that. Um, there are very few cases like that. Um, for me, the thought comes to mind of it'll depend on the either infrared or ultraviolet spectrum of the petals. So if there's something spotty, so like there's a bunch of petunias that are galaxy petunias, which are really gorgeous, but a lot of petunias and other kind of radial shaped flowers have almost like flashing lights for bees. They have these lines that we can't see that bees can um, that direct them to the nectar source. So do a little research on the variety, see if it's a pollinator friendly plant. A lot of times it usually is. If it's you know a, cult, a cultivar of a native plant, um, as long as it's not anything incredibly exotic, pollinators are probably gonna love it. Vivian asked uh, about the need where she is to control ants, <clears throat> specifically fire ants. Mm -hmm. And is she's wondering if that is going to endanger pollinators? No, it will not. It will not. It's a completely different um, insecticide and they have completely different habits. So bees are not going to forage for the same things that ants are. Great. <laughs> Here's a great question from Deborah, which probably has no answer or at least not one we can give over the air. I it's love this. question about whether yellow jackets have any redeeming qualities. They are very important predators and very important scavengers. So in a forest ecosystem, they will keep other pest populations at bay and they will help to break down carcasses. But in the middle of your yard, not so much. Great. Uh, Valerie also asked uh, about living in a uh, small, an area with a small lake and they've been very lucky because uh, they've not had problems with mosquitoes uh, mm -hmm. and that they feed a lot on, uh, we feed a lot of birds, she said, and we have bats and swallows and that helps a lot. And so I guess if you're in a country setting like that, you've got some natural, speaking of predators, natural predators mm -hmm. uh, to deal with the mosquito side of things. And then the pollinators can just go about their business. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, uh, one more question, Susie asked if uh, I call it Lariope or Lariope uh, is a good pollinator plant. I'm familiar with the purple ones, but uh, you may have a thought about those flowers. I've not really seen a lot of pollinators at them, but to be fair, it's because there's a lot of other things blooming at the same time. Um, typically when I see it. Um, so, I mean, it's a great shade plant and I've seen small insects on it before. So a lot of times, because it's so close to the ground, you'll get a lot of beetle pollinators to it. Um, you might get some ants and things like that. Um, it can be a little invasive. So if you're next to a, uh, you know, kind of an untouched forest or something, I'd be careful of where you plant it because it does produce those berries that get spread by birds. Um, but for the most part, you know, it, it, I wouldn't plant it as a pollinator plant. We usually recommend it as a um, shade loving grass alternative. Um, but, you know, no reason to cut the flowers down. If you see things, I'd be interested to know what kind of pollinators you actually see um, at those flowers, because I don't see that many usually. Good point. Well, I think that's the main bulk of the questions that we had tonight. 
Uh, there were some other questions about the other programs that mm -hmm. come by way of this North Fulton Master Gardener effort to uh, keep good uh, thinking going on about all the topics that you've just talked about, as well as other plant-focused topics. So I'll turn it now back to you and let you finish up. But we've had some great questions, and I hope uh, the others uh, that I didn't get to or that were about the programs will be able to find those answers by connecting either to you or to uh, some other Master Gardener or our website. So I'll turn it back to you now. Awesome. Thank you so much. So while you were talking, Tom, I actually just did uh, a little bit of scrolling through the chat and I do want to clarify something. So Tom, you asked about mosquito friendly um, places and somebody mentioned that there is no mosquito friendly insecticide spray and you are 100% right. Um, the, what we are looking at is for ways to minimize risk. And so I can see how that was a little bit misleading. So I do want to, uh, you know, apologize for that, but yes, no, um, if at all possible, always do sustainable, like use a box fan. Don't apply anything. If you don't have to, we always recommend thresholds and, um, you know, applying a chemical is always the very, very last step. You really need to mitigate a problem then, um, you know, contact us and we can help you do it sustainably and responsibly um, while minimizing any harm uh, to your bees. So yes, there is no mosquito or there is no uh, bee friendly pesticide, but it's all in how you apply it, the correct dosages and where you apply it. Um, so there will be a survey at the end and Dana has put some helpful links in the chat. Um, so if you are um, interested in um, becoming a master gardener, learning more about North Fulton Master Gardeners or Cooperative Extension, please follow those links. Again, you can, I don't have the link on me right now, but I can forward it. So hopefully y'all will get it later um, uh, to the Shade Gardening for Pollinators lecture tomorrow. It will be me again, as long as you won't get tired of me from seven to eight very similar setup to this. Um, and we will be talking about some of those shade options that were asked about tonight for folks that don't have a big sunny meadow, even though they might want it. Um, so again, thank you to sponsors, partners, these lovely master gardeners who make me so proud, so happy to have y'all uh, as part of this program. And thank you so much for all of our participants for showing up. Um, really enjoyed the questions, fantastic questions. Um, so, oh yes. Okay. So y'all were able to register for tomorrow's event. Perfect. I love hearing that. Um, all right. So with that, I can let y'all, I believe I can let y'all go unless anybody else has anything to add. So thank y'all so much. And I'm going to go ahead and sign off.